next Imaging One World lecture series. And um, today we're looking at very small things in great detail, I think. And um, I hope everybody has kept well and is enjoying that it's now getting a bit more possible for people to go to work, at least in, in our part of the world. Um, and I have, I think, Nick Barry from the LMB introducing our speaker today. And we're looking forward to another inspirational talk on imaging in Imaging One World. Thank you very much. All right, well, it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, Seamus Holden from uh, Newcastle University. Seamus um, first did his undergrad work at uh, Oxford in physics and then PhD in the lab of Achilles Kapanadis at Oxford working on uh, single molecule fluorescence. So there his big, big uh, contribution to the field was the Dow storm algorithm, which basically allows you to um, uh, fit overlapping emitters for a storm or palm super resolution microscopy. He followed that up with a postdoc in uh, Celia Manley's lab at the EPFL, and that was basically working on um, sort of high throughput super resolution microscopy. And that's where he started um, looking at subskeletal proteins in, uh, in the bacteria. And since then, he started his own work in the uh, Centre for Bacterial Cell Biology at Newcastle University and was being awarded a, a, a Henry Dale, Sir Henry Dale Fellowship for his work. And actually, in 2020, uh, Seamus was awarded the British Biophysical Society um, Louise Johnson Early Career Award. So, really, a, 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 a great scientist, and um, I'm really looking forward to hearing your talk. So, with that, I'll hand over to you, Seamus. Thank you very much. Um, Nick, uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. So um, hopefully I can uh, <laughs> I can deliver on, on the goods now. I've had this very, very kind and, and lots of kind words. Anyway, I, I, so um, right. So today I'm going to tell you about um, how to build a wall, which by the way is not, or at least was not intentionally a reference to Donald Trump, but I guess, anyway. Um, but uh, so so I'm going to talk about using and developing uh, advanced live cell fluorescence microscopy to understand how bacteria divide. And uh, I just thought I'd start because um, I, I don't know what the audience for this is going to be. Um, if I think about what the audience for the One World series has been so far, it's kind of a diverse microscopy focused interdisciplinary crowd. And I've really tried to make this talk. So, so my lab, we, we do a combination of being obsessed with the biophysics of how bacteria grow and divide and, and their cell envelope. And at the same time, using and developing advanced microscopy techniques, which allow us to solve those problems, but also kind of broader optical bacteriology problems. And what I've taken this talk as an opportunity to do is to really try to tell the story about the biology but especially to geek out on, on the, um, the, mi the microscopy methods, because quite often I don't get the opportunity to do that. And I think every I enjoy it, and I think everyone will appreciate that, hopefully, in this audience. Um, and so some of the, maybe the biology controls are something I'm, I'm happy to talk about after, but I've maybe skipped over a little bit to spend a bit more time on, on the, the microscopy elements. Um, so, uh, all right, and I'm just going to keep an eye on the time as we go. Um, and, and also, um, so, so hopefully I can convince you that uh, imaging and advanced imaging bacteria is worthwhile. And, and, and the last thing is that this, I, I would like this to be considered as kind of a manifesto for uh, user developers in advanced microscopy. So there's a lot of labs that do amazing work in either just application of microscopy or, or method development and collaborate. And I root, but, and that's, that's very valid, but I also think there's a big space and it's very important. Uh, to appreciate the power of being able to do a bit of both. And then, you know, maybe once you get stuck on either side, being able to pull in collaborators, but if you can develop the methods as you go along with biology, you can move quite fast and discover quite interesting things. So anyway, um, let's, let's see. Um, okay, so the central question that motivates this talk and really everything um, I, I study is how proteins build complex structure. And this is really a question that, that is, is relevant from, you know, from E. coli to the elephant, right? So um, fundamentally how nanoscale proteins build in the context of bacteria, micro scale structures, and, but that's a general problem. 
um, and uh, that applies to all living organisms essentially. And the primary model system that we use to study this question is bacterial cell wall remodeling. So bacteria are surrounded by a peptidoglycan coat of armor. So that's this mesh-like coat of armor that um, protects the cell against environmental insult and also the high osmotic pressure of the cell. Um, and the, the gram pot, so there's two, so there's roughly two kinds of bacteria, gram positive, gram negative simplification. But anyway, the, the, the type of bacteria we study, Bacillus subtilis, the gram positive primary model organism, um, gram positive bacteria have a single cell membrane, it's called plasma membrane, that's on the inside of the cell wall. And the cell wall is reasonably thick, so it's 20 or 30 layers thick. Um, and it's quite tough. And, and, and so you don't want your nice, lovely coat of armor to become a coffin, right? So, so in order to grow and divide bacteria, you need to constantly enzymatically remodel their cell wall. And um, they do this with um, enzymes, a diverse array of enzymes called peptidoglycan polymerases. And essentially what they do is they polymerase these um, glycan strands and then cross-link them in to existing glycan strands via these peptide bridges. So that's either via individual polymerases or hollow enzymes so of, of multiple proteins working as a, uh, a polymerase. Um, and to kind of give you a sense of the physics of the problem, I really like to start um, with this really simplified toy model that was published by Grant Jensen's lab a few years ago. And I do emphasize that this is just a toy model. It leaves out most many key essential features that in practice are important to, to truly like build a build a biological um, growth and division machine, right? But it, it emphasizes, so all it says is, um, how could individual polymerases work together to elongate the cell? And, and the thing to, it's incredibly simplified. It's also just got a thin cell wall. There's no cytoskeleton, et cetera. But what is really key um, and, and, I, and worth remembering from, from the studies, it just shows how inherently stochastic and single molecule driven the process of bacterial cell wall remodeling is. Um, and so, so nano, and the other point is that nanoscale synthesis um, results in this highly ordered microscale structure, right? So they're the puzzles. How do single molecules work together to build a big thing? That's also even less clear how you might divide such a structure. Um, right. Now, this is not just a neat intellectual puzzle. The bacterial cell wall was our first antimicrobial target with the invention of penicillin way back, and it remains our best antibiotics target. And, and antimicrobial resistance, the death toll now is worldwide is about 0.7 million deaths a year, which compared to say the COVID pandemic is 0.25 of the total COVID deaths every single year. And by 2050, if it's business as usual, we don't develop more anti antibiotics and we don't do better antibiotic stewardship, all of this sort of thing. It's realistically projected to hit 10 million deaths a year, which would be, just be catastrophic for even how we organize modern medicine. Um, and, and so the, the rationale of, of our work being useful in this context is that it's easier to destroy something if you understand how it's built. And there's still a great deal, hopefully, of convince you to understand about physical principles of uh, cell, bacterial cell growth and division. So that, that's why we do what we do. Okay, so how do you build a wall? Um, nanometer scale synthesis build micro scale wall, right? So it's a cross wall in the middle of the cell. Um, that then partitions the cell and it's subsequently cleaved in two. And we're not gonna worry about the cleavage bit, we're just gonna worry about wall building today. And the rough kind of genetic sketch of how this works is a cytoskeletal protein, the ancestral homologue of tubulin, is a protein called FTSZ. It's almost universally essential in the bacteria and it arrives at mid-cell and forms this band of filaments. Those filaments, recruit uh, peptide glycan polymerases to the future uh, cell division site. And then those division, uh, the, those division proteins build this septum. And so essentially you've got this, uh, this complex of synthesis machines and guiding cytoskeleton. And the question is how they physically build this wall. And the, the biochemistry and genetics of this problem are reasonably well mapped out how this, how this works mechanistically as a multi-protein bio nano machine is not or it was not um, and, and that's really the, the puzzle that we're, that we're looking at and, and so that's the core puzzle what's the physical mechanism to vision and just remember if you screw it up you die well if bacteria screw it up they die right um, 
Right, so how do we study the physical principles of cell division directly in the living cell? Um, so, so just to sum up what I've introduced, right, biophysically, the key features are that this process is single molecule driven. It's multi-scale, it bridges about a thousand fold difference in scale. It's multi-protein and it's inherently stochastic and dynamic. So I would argue that this really means that you require the live cell context. And, and I think light microscopy is pretty much the only technique capable of tackling this problem directly in the living cell. But um, proteins and bacteria are really small. And that makes this problem technically hard, um, which actually is quite fun because it, it, it means that we've got both an interesting biological and um, optical problem. And so the reason this is hard is, is if we, uh, so I've drawn here um, some of the interesting structural features in bacteria. So you've got a division site, you've got a bacterial nucleoid, that's this wiggly thing, you've got RNAP and ribosomes, and uh, the, the machinery here, the MREB, a longer zone machinery responsible for elongating cells. If you blur this to uh, light microscopy diffraction limit of resolution, you can see the difficulty of imaging in bacterial cells, which is that the organization of internal cellular structures in bacteria is on the order of uh, the, the limit of spatial resolution of a light microscope. And, and so um, this obviously means that super resolution and single molecule techniques are really key to understanding how bacteria are organized. But one thing I think that's important to, that's sometimes underappreciated is important to think of and for, it was really important for us in tackling the questions posed in this talk is it's not just a question of the diffraction limit. It's also a question of uh, photo bleaching and phototoxicity in live cells. So a small volume of bacteria um, means that they're particularly prone to rapid photo bleaching and phototoxicity because all of the lovely excitation confinement techniques that have been developed, even turf, right? You're still illuminating like a sixth of the cell and light sheet techniques um, just will illuminate a whole cell. So they're basically irrelevant in the context of bacteria. So if you want to mitigate uh, uh, phototoxicity and bleaching type issues to image bacteria and subcellular localization for extended periods, you really need to get quite clever with both limits of conventional light microscopy and especially the image processing that you do as well. Um, right, so that's kind of that, that, that's kind of the rationale. So the way we've tackled this work problem in, in recent years has really been by focusing on, on this protein FTS set and asking what its function is in cell division. And, and that's motivated by the fact that it's, it's almost universally essential and its role has really been mysterious for a long time. So we knew it was important for cell division, but not why. And, and so we can start um, by looking just by time-lapse wide field microscopy at the localization of this protein FTS. And you can see it forms a constricting mid cell band. There you go. Um, and you can see that it's visibly highly dynamic. It kind of forms these sparse structures to begin with, that condense and then start to constrict. Um, but the density of filaments is much too great to resolve filament organization and dynamics, at least in this imaging approach and geometry. So the optical challenge was to figure out how to take better pictures of cell division protein dynamics. And um, my proposal from a few years ago now is that we could substantially improve the quality of uh, bacterial cell division imaging through control cell orientation. So, so that's um, for this reason. So if you do conventional uh, immobilization imaging of a cell, so rod-shaped cells, they will sit sideways on a covered microscope covered glass, either because you've stuck them to it or because you've sandwiched them between glass and agarose. And even if you've got different shapes of cells, then the best you can do if you've got like round cells is they'll be in random orientations, but we're concerned with rod-shaped cells here. Um, and they'll be sideways and you'll be stuck taking a picture of the division plane side on. And, and that limits you to either um, doing 3D imaging and axial resolution is always poorer and you also need to do Z-stacks or you do TERF, um, which will illuminate the very bottom of the cell, um, but it's just a tiny slice of the division side. That's, that's very powerful, but, but inherently limited. Um, so my idea was what if we could stand the bacteria on their heads in little traps, um, because that would then allow us to image the whole septum in a single focal plane um, at higher resolution, lateral versus axial, and at higher speed, because you don't need to do dead stacking. Um, so, so that would, so it would essentially transform a 3D imaging problem into 2D imaging problem. And um, that's what, for the purposes of this talk, I'm calling Vercini 
0.5 alpha, right? So this is our first attempt at the technique in 2016-2017. Uh, so the Ver Vercini stands for Vertical Cell Imaging by Nanostructural Mobilization. And this was developed in collaboration with Case Decker's lab in, in Delft. They're fantastic by nanotechnologists. And, and they were able to figure out how to, how to um, fabricate such, such, a, such a technology of such pillars. Um, so we worked together on this. And what they came up with was these nanofabricated uh, e-beam lithography etch plus etching uh, pillars. Um, and then we imprinted agarose with those pillars and then trapped bacteria in this micro patterned agarose. And that worked quite well. Uh, but before I go on, I'm just going to introduce the analysis method that, that uh, we use throughout uh, this work, which is called chymographs. Many of you probably know this, but if you don't, you'd have a problem for the rest of the talk. So I'll just go through it. Um, so you have uh, dynamics along a one dimensional line. In this case, the circumference of a cell. Um, so a chymograph is where you calculate the line profile along your structure of interest and for every single frame of your movie you plot the intensity as a single pixel row so you've got position here in this case around the cell circumference and you've got time on the y-axis and it's a great way of analyzing the motion of motile particles um, if you've got a stationary particle you get a vertical line if you've got a moving particle then you get a horizontal line um, which the angle of which is proportional to the uh, to the speed. Okay, so uh, uh, really outstanding graduate student in my lab, Callum Jukes, um, then used this uh, technology to investigate the dynamics of FTSZ, and you can see already it's substantially better images than in that top-down uh, movie that I showed. And what what he discovered was that FTSZ forms these motile filaments moving in both directions um, throughout the division process. Um, it, the signal to noise here isn't great, but you'll see it gets better as we go on. This was the first time it was already a lot better than, than we had before. Um, and a single molecule, uh, so the, the individual filaments moved at about 30 nanometers per second. And the, the individual subunits of those filaments um, as determined by single molecule tracking of sparsely labeled monomers, uh, uh, sub uh, uh, proteins within the overall filaments, they were absolutely immobile. And so what that was, was um, the hallmark of a type of motion called treadmilling, which is, is, uh, is quite well known in the context of eukaryotic cell biology, particularly for actin, um, but was not really expected in the context of uh, um, uh, the back of bacteria. Although I should say that that this, uh, I'll go on and, and present the in vitro context in a minute. So, so what that is, is a type of motion where you have uh, plus end growth and minus end depolymerization. So the individual subunits don't move, but the overall filament moves. And this um, was uh, a demonstration of the in vivo physiological relevance of, uh, of this of this FTSZ treadmilling motion, which had been discovered in vitro a few years before. But demonstrating it in vivo was really quite a shock um, because for a long time, FTSZ had rather been thought of as this structural support, which would then guide, um, it slightly invaginate the membrane and essentially then just um, localize the cell wall sensitivity to the mid cell. But instead it was, it was a revision to um, many motile independent filaments moving around each other at mid cell. And then in collaboration with multiple labs um, uh, together, we then went on to show that not only does FTS set treadmill, but um, the synthases move processively around the division site at the same speed. And that um, the, the rate of constriction is to a large degree set by the rate of treadmilling, or at least that was the initial draft. It's, it's certainly treadmilling had a significant influence on, on constriction rate. And that led us to propose an initial model of uh, a tightly coupled cytoskeleton synthase complexes, which would build the cell walls. So, so this is the idea that the cytoskeleton motion is an obligatory guide for the synthase motion. And, and essentially, if you stop the, syn the, the, the cytoskeleton, you'd stop the synthesis. So, so this tightly coupled complex. Um, it's a cool model, but um, I mean, the interesting thing about a model, right, is to try and figure out um, the interesting ways in which it's wrong. 
I guess. And, and that's really what we've been doing for the last few years. I also have tried to put forward the proposal in the field that we could call this the Wrigley Worm model. For some reason, it hasn't caught on. You, know, you never know, it might. Um, anyway, um, so so yes, so so what we've been trying to figure out since is, is uh, the details of, of how the system works. And essentially, um, firstly, we, we found that this tightly coupled aspect is, is, is uh, turns out not to hold up, uh, even if even if they have still substantial interactions between the cytoskeleton and synthase. And actually, the key roles of, of this protein FTS set is, is much earlier in the cell division process during initiation. And this has been work uh, spearheaded by both Kevin Whitley, a postdoc in my lab, who also started out in, in Case Decker's lab as well, and, um, and Callum Jukes, uh, the graduate student who I already mentioned. And this work should be out in Nature Communications either this week or next, but you can read it on, on the preprint up until that point. Um, yeah, so it turns out to be even cooler than this. Right, so um fts so the so what we started out by doing was asking um how the cell division process changes over time and and initially specifically how the dynamics and organization of this protein fts said vary over the bacterial cell cycle so we went back to our time lapse uh, wide field microscopy uh, I mean, actually, it's inclined illumination if we're geeking out here, right, to increase signal to noise a bit. And what we could see visibly was that initially uh, FTS said assembles in this sparse band of filaments, which then appears to rapidly condense into a narrow sub diffraction limited band. And then you start to constrict. And, and we so we analyzed this quantitatively to try and figure out whether that held up and, and, and what was going on there. So we quantified the diameter of these Z rings and their thickness. And, and to do that, we used a custom um, elastic uh, image segmentation workflow because you see there's a lot of background here and these uh, filaments are very sparse. So differentiating background and, and these filaments was not trivial. So custom segmentation workflow, then tracking and then quantum analysis of, of these Z-ring dimensions. And so we're able to measure the diameter. So you see cells start out, Z-ring start out wide and then eventually they constrict. And also the thickness of these rings. And, and what was interesting here, so we were able to analyze um, changes in ring thickness just using change point classification. And, and we observed that uh, rings stochastically and apparently in a single step fashion condense into a narrow ring about 10 minutes before they initiate constriction. Um, and so we were then able to go and then we wanted to analyze the dynamics of FTS set filaments in each of these cell cycle stages. And this is quite tricky. So this nascent Z ring stage, oh yes, yeah, so that was the other thing was to name them, right? You've got a nascent Z ring stage, um, which then condenses into what we call a mature Z ring and then a constricting Z ring or cell division um, site. And this nascent state has lots of sparse filaments and inherently high, there's always inherently high background because you've got lots of FTS monomers floating around in the cytoplasm. But um, the, there's sparse, reasonably isolated, uh, low intensity filaments in this state, um, which is an imaging challenge. And then um, the signal gets brighter, but only because the filaments all condense into a narrow ring, so the density goes up. Um, so in, is identifying individual pro filament or bundles of filament dynamics is tricky. And then the diameter decreases, which makes it even trickier because you hit a resolution issue. Um, so imaging uh, these structures is tricky. Our Vercini technique that we developed was nice, uh, powerful, but not initially sufficient. And uh, you can see here that the signal to noise is sufficient to resolve protein motion, right? You see these diagonal lines it's hard to resolve the dynamics of individual either filaments or filament bundles say for example to know where they start and where they end um, where they interact <clears throat> uh, so we needed to improve the technology uh, to improve the signal to noise the throughput so we could get more sufficient statistics and, and, and the ability to quantify um, and this, I should say, was not a case of applying super resolution microscopy. Super resolution microscopy can solve many problems, but actually um, what we needed here was extended sensitive dynamics. And for instance, applying SIM uh, didn't work uh, because um, you needed more light, right? You needed more light than just wide field or, or, or uh, high level illumination. And so you just bleach your cells quicker and then we couldn't answer a dynamic question. And so it wasn't, super resolution in this case wasn't the solution, rather it was trying to increase the sensitivity of our diffraction limited measurements. So how do we do that? Well, for a start, the higher throughput bit 
Um, we got a bigger camera, that's not that impressive. We improved our chip design um, so that we could load more cells in. And it, especially we developed a new centrifugation based loading and washing protocol, which allowed us to load a much higher fraction of cells into the micro hole cell traps. And that gave us much higher throughput so that we could un, uh, analyze hundreds of cells for an experiment. Um, one of the most critical developments was to apply established image denoising techniques uh, to, to uh, our experiments. And so we used um, uh, non-local means denoising, specifically the pure denoise algorithm. And essentially what this does is it using a similarity metric that identifies similar patches in space and especially in time, because there's a lot of redundancy of, of time-lapse movies in time and then does a weighted average of similar pixels in space and time. Now, it doesn't have any assumptions on sample structure, unlike, say, deep learning methods, um, aside from essentially continuity or some degree of continuity, which is pretty much guaranteed by the diffraction of that. And it preserves edges and intensities pretty well. Now, it's essentially what this did, or in our hands, we found that it greatly enhanced signal to noise and allowed us to reduce the light dose, light dose essentially for free. And just to illustrate how uh, game changing this was, um, this is the sort of signal to noise that we can now uh, acquire data at, um, which I find quite hard to identify any uh, clear protein motion. Once you've denoised it, um, it, hopefully you can see blobs moving around the cell, right? And so, certainly at least, and I, of course, this is a question of how well Zoom, how much Zoom is compressing these videos, I don't know, but there's blobs moving around the cell and the signal to noise is much higher. And so that allows us to ex acquire for longer with less photo bleaching, which is a big deal um, for these measurements. And the other thing that we did was um, a custom uh, approach to uh, quantifying intensity and subtracting the background. Now, the background, in this case, and in many cases, no doubt, um, is, is complex and specific to the sample. So here it's complicated because you've got a cytoplasm full of quite a lot of signal, in this case, FTSF monomers, and you've got a cell standing on its head. So you've got the in-focus plane and you've got contributions from above and below. And so, so you have this quite complex semi-Gaussian but long-tailed signal raw classic background subtraction methods like say rolling ball were, were not working sufficiently um and so what we did was we calibrated um that uh that signal that background signal on just cytoplasm only samples expressing just gfp and we we're able to measure it as well approximated by a gauss cauchy combined background and then we could combine so we were able to explicitly fit that model uh, combined with a 12 sectored annulus describing the actual signal. Um, and we could fit that to the raw data and then use that for every single uh, frame to subtract out the fitted background. And that gave us quite a sub, uh, substantial increase in the signal to noise, especially in these nascent rings um, where the filament density was low. And so that, that was really quite uh, powerful. And so in the end, that gave us what I now call in Vercini 1.0 in the software parlance, this would be like the release version, right? So, um, so we do, uh, right, we make our pillars, we imprint, we centrifuge the cells in, um, we image with nice high signal to noise, high low, ring high low microscopy, and then we have these custom background subtraction and fitting algorithms. And that gives us, in the end, um, lots of cells with visible um, pretty dynamics. And you'll see here, um, cells with lots of FTS set filaments moving around. Um, and this is just the com co example of the before and after, right? So, so this is the signal to noise we started with and, and with the improved method, this is the signal to noise we end with. And hopefully you can see here now that you've got lots of filaments, which you can clearly see. They may be bundles of filaments, but you can see the isolated motile entities anyway. Um, and there's some evidence for variable speeds, particularly there's a lot of evidence of immobile foci. So these are these vertical lines in addition to uh, structures that are treadmilling. And I would argue that this is pretty much some of the most sensitive measurements of totally labeled uh, proteins in life bacteria to date. Um, and right, so what did that tell us? Well, firstly, it told us that FTS said filament dynamics are cell cycle dependent. So these are these nascent Z rings early in the cell, cell early in the cell division cycle. And what you can see is that filaments don't just treadmill. There's, there's some that do these crisscrossy treadmilling lines, but there's a lot of immobile, transiently bound 
FTSZ filaments that, that aren't moving. Once the uh, Z ring condenses into a mature Z ring, actually, the majority of FTSZ filaments do move. Uh, so you can see here, basically, almost all you can see is a much denser uh, population of uh, crisscrossy thread milling filaments. And that then persists as the cells constrict. And, and so we can quantify this. So if you quantify the speed, um, you can see that initially in low density rings, you start with this, uh, this mixed population of immobile and mobile filaments, which then um, rapidly uh, transitions to this predominantly motile form of filament. So filament dynamics are cell cycle regulated. So what else is cell cycle regulated? Um, how do uh, treadmilling filaments influence the rest of the cell division machinery during each stage of uh, bacterial cell division? So um, the experiment that we wanted to do to figure this out was to rapidly halt FTSZ dynamics um, at different stages of the cell cycle and see what happens to uh, septa. Do they constrict? Do they progress through the cell cycle? What happens? And in order to do this, we needed to combine our high resolution Vercini technique with the ability to chemically treat cells. So that's essentially a Mike Fwidic version of the technique. And so, so Kevin developed this technique. Um, so so uh, we call it micro Vercini. And essentially what that involves is um, flipping the geometry of this uh, apparatus on its head. So instead of micro hole uh, trapped cells in agarose and sandwich between that and the cover slip, which isn't really that com particularly compatible with uh, chemical treatment. You flip it on its head, so you have open chambers of PDMS now, um, which you can then uh, flow uh, drugs over. And uh, in practice, this means you put your PDMS on a cover slip. Um, actually, using a reasonably simple type of flow chamber um, made from double-sided tape, and then pipette tips on top drilled into a thicker cover slide, assembled, and we call that microfluidic Vercini. And what that allows, oh, uh, yeah, ah, yes. Yeah. So this is, a, as I mentioned, an opportunity to geek out about the, the subtleties of, of the technique and, and, and bacterial imaging. So uh, the challenge with this microscopically is that, um, this ends up placing the bacteria far further away from the cover slip than we've normally imaged. Normally they'd be, you know, zero to six microns from the cover slip, right? Depending on how, how the focal plane, depending on how long the cells are. Um, in this case, because PDMS has a certain thickness in order for it to be uh, robust, uh, they're about 50 microns away from the cover slip. And that means that the conventional autofocus systems that we'd use, which are reflection based, um, don't work. But we need live, rapid, stable autofocus, or uh, focal drift will just destroy our imaging resolution. So how did we do that? Um, well, actually, um, this problem had, we figured out that this, pro there, uh, this problem had, sim a, a solution to this had previously been developed for fixed cells in single molecule localization microscopy. Although to my knowledge, no one had thought yet to use it for live cell imaging, but it turns out to be really powerful for that too. And so the concept here developed by Bo, Bo Huang's group is to do bright field imaging in the infrared channel, simultaneous and continuous um, with the fluorescence imaging in a separate channel. And so you, so you have your continuous infrared bright field imaging and you compare the image that you get to a pre-recorded stack uh, Z stack of cell images. And that allows you through cross correlation to um, identify uh, drift, axial drift, and also lateral drift on your microscope system. So as the system drifts, you can then cross correlate and move your sample stage to the most similar plane or to back to your uh, initial plane rather. And that allows you to hardware lock um, the, the position between the sample and the objective, just like you often do with reflection-based autofocus, but that doesn't work for thick samples, right? And it turns out that this works really nicely and for live cells, just as much as it does for thick cells. And so what we did was we created a open source hardware software imp implementation of this uh, for live XYZ block, a nice little micromanager plugin. Um, full details of this are on the Lifehack website. I'll give you a quick whistle stops tour of this Lifehack microscope right at the very end. And this, uh, this solution was a really nice collaboration with Ricardo Henriquez's lab. Uh, right, so we did that. Um, and then we're able to get the system to work. 
and ask the question. Um, so so we, had, we knew we had a potential tool to probe the importance of treadmilling, which was this drug, PC190723. It's a candidate antimicrobial. It's actually, there's a derivative of it in phase two clinical trials now for staph aureus. But anyway, it specifically binds FDS set. It prevents filament depolymerization, and we previously showed that it inhibits treadmilling. Um, but um, we didn't know the time scale of effect. So it could be anywhere from you know, one second to 10 minutes. And the trouble is if it was 10 minutes, um, then, um, then you wouldn't have a cell cycle resolve tool because cell division only takes about 20 minutes. So you need something with as, as high time resolution in terms of time scale of effect as possible, as fraction of the cell cycle, um, so that you can inhibit treadmilling and then ask how that affects specific stages of the cell cycle. And so what this microfracini technique allowed us to do was to diagnose uh, antibiotic mode of action um, with filament and a, high, a single, near single filament and high time resolution and to test exactly this. So um, here's FTS set filaments. The chiograph shows crisscrossy lines, which indicates treadmilling. And then to the time resolution of our measurement, we treat with drug and the filaments stop moving as shown by these vertical lines, right? Um, so that allowed us to nail down the time scale of effect of FTS set to a few seconds, the time, so less than five seconds, and certainly the time resolution of our measurement. And that meant that we could use PC19 as a precision tool for its dissecting cell division dynamics. So we could then go back to time lapses of horizontal cells, treat them um, with PC19. You can see that happens here. Um, there's a pretty characteristic phenotype that you get lots of uh, uh, monomers binding to the sidewall. But the other thing that you can see is that some cells, their septa continue to constrict um, after you've treated with drug. They wiggle around a lot, so it can be tricky. But and this guy, however, does not. Okay, and then eventually you lose it. Um, so, um, so what's going on, right? So, so the simple. I'll pause this. The simple model that we initially proposed of tight cytoskeleton synthase coupling would say if you stop uh, cell division dynamics, um, then uh, it's just treadmilling dynamics, then you should stop cell division, but that's not happening. And, and so we were able to go through and analyze the effect on each cell cycle stage. So, uh, oh, and just to say that this observation that uh, some cells are able to continue to constrict um, and, and specifically those which had initiated constriction. That was pioneering work led by Mariana Pinho's group separately in Staph aureus, and which then inspired us to go back and revisit these questions. Um, so uh, nascent Z-rings, sparse filaments, any nascent Z-ring which you treat with PC19 fails to constrict. And not only does it fail to constrict, it absolutely stops its progression in the cell division cycle. So it doesn't condense either. Um, and so this is just a, an, an image of an exemplar ring, which is, is just failing to condense. Um, and that then, we then went back and looked at our um, nascent Z rings imaged by Vercini, and we were able to identify, so this is not drug treated, right? But we were able to identify many instances of FTS Z filament collision and interaction, right? So here's two filaments, one, two, uh, effectively uh, colliding with each other, apparently pausing for a substantial amount of time and then um, and then uh, moving on. And, and you can look at many other examples uh, in, in the paper, but um, this is an example of motel filament aggregation, we think. And that gives a likely explanation for why FTSA treadmilling is absolutely required for Z ring condensation and further progression in the cell cycle. And, and that's because you've got sparse filaments and if they're moving around, they can interact with each other. And we saw already that you have an aggregation transition of filaments, right? And, and for filaments to aggregate, then they need to interact, stick to each other. And eventually enough of them will do that, that they will collapse into a single narrow band. If they can't move, they're just gonna bind to the membrane, not explore their surface and, and, and interact with their partners and then just unbind again. And so that appears to be, is that essentially shows that treadmilling is required to explore that surface and mediate Z-ring aggregation and condensation. Um, and right, so um, so not only that, cells which had condensed, um, they're interesting, right? Some of them continued after treatment to constrict, some of them didn't. 
Once cells had visibly started constriction, once you treated with the drug, they all constricted. And we could nail down what was going on in this intermediate period, um, ultimately reasonably straightforwardly, right? So just to sum up here, all the nascent Z rings constricted, uh, failed to constrict, all the constricting Z, all, essentially all of the constricting Z rings constricted, and this is essentially a signal to noise issue. Um, and, and then the, the, the condensed but not initiated period was intermediate. And we could just nail that down uh, using an additional marker. And um, this protein PUP2B has been shown to mark constriction initiated. It arrives pretty much simultaneously with septum building. And so we just did a two color experiment and cells which did not have this protein, so which had not uh, initiated constriction, they were the ones that failed to constrict. Whereas cells where this protein had arrived, so cells that initiated constriction, um, they were the ones which could complete constriction. So um, to sum up this bit, um, so to sum up this bit, um, FTSZ treadmilling, we, we concluded, has two essential roles, right? It's to condense the Z ring. If you don't condense, you can't divide, and it's to, um, it's to, uh, to initiate constriction. But after you've initiated constriction, cells can still constrict. Um, but it turns out FTSZ treadmilling is still important uh, for constriction, so we're able to quantify how fast these cells constricted. Right, and um, although they can still constrict, they do it substantially slower when you treat with drugs. So apparently, FTS at dynamics have a dispensable but still important role in active constriction. And exactly what that is, we need to nail down in future. So, so I think now we have a first draft of the core physical principles of bacterial cell division, which is that treadmilling motility drives condensation of these FTS at filaments into a narrow band to define the division site. Then treadmilling FTS filaments drive initial septal synthesis. The mechanism of, of why they are required for initiation remains unclear, as does why they are partially dispensable once you start to build a septum. Although one can speculate that perhaps the semi is the established septum leading edge can act once you started to build it as, as enough of a guide that can then be extended. Um, but that all needs further work. And I, I'd argue at this point, finally, we pretty much know why bacterial tubulin is so important. Along the way, we developed uh, powerful new optical bacteriology tools. Um, I should say, uh, so yeah, you can read about this, right? Um, but we are also writing up a methods protocols paper on bridging. It's all open source anyway, but just super detailed protocols on how you can reproduce it in your own lab if you want to, right? And, and so we'll hopefully get that out soon. Um, and just in the last literally two minutes of the talk, I just want to introduce the other tool that we developed along the way uh, that supported this work, which is an open source uh, microscope called the Lifehack system. And I'll just show you the pretty video first. So this is an open source modular microscope for live and fixed cell single molecule imaging with an emphasis on the live, which is where we feel the kind of unique selling point and kind of why we developed this in comparison to say existing open source microscopes. So where this microscope really excels is in imaging single molecules or single protein filaments at uh, high resolution in live cells. And so we've got this custom box and we can incubate the whole system with low drift at stable temperature. Um, we've got best in class focus lock both through this image based XYZ drift correction and also reflection based autofocus, which derives from a commercial system, but we've extended it such that it can lock in anywhere from zero to 10 microns from the cover slip. Um, and then all the other features which you'd expect from a single molecule microscope like uh, 3D tracking via astigmatism and this sort of thing. Um, we've got a nice website. Um, which has extremely detailed assembly instructions and the whole CAD models of the system are accessible online. We haven't published this yet, we've pushed it out early um, in order to, uh, as in we've made the whole system accessible before publication because really what we want is feedback um, of, of uh, what the community wants from it, thinks of it and how they, they develop it further and, and also take modules from it and, inc and incorporate it into their systems. Um, so I'm interested to see what the community makes of it. And with that, uh, I would like to thank all of my team, um, especially uh, Callum and Kevin, who led the work, um, and uh, my collaborators, 
uh, and uh, funders and you for listening. And I'm happy to take questions. I don't know whether we're doing that after the quiz or before the quiz, but whatever works. Thank you very I'm much. To... Super, yeah. Should we do the uh, the quiz now and then questions after? Yes, after? we can do the quiz first. I already put the link into the chat so people can log in. And um, I think it should be open. And then I'm always struggling with how to do, make it present. Should I stop sharing or something? Oh yeah, you would have to stop sharing. Yeah, that's true. That would be and uh, if anyone else has got more questions, please. Thank you very much for now. And then, yeah, so. Yeah. Do feel free to write more questions into the chat while we while we set this up. Thanks very much. We have some kind of rather violent. Kind of <laughs> Was it okay like this? I can see that fine, Steffi. Yeah. Good, thank you. I was meant to put it in full view, but now I'm kind of in screen sharing. It doesn't. Uh, but this is a great question, but it's not one of mine. <laughs> well, I'm a bit worried that the big bomb is actually bigger than anything else in here. It's, um, um, maybe we should move on. <laughs> I'm getting a bit nervous with this one. <laughs> If you have put a big bomb in here, you will be disqualified from winning the quiz. <laughs> I think. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> okay, let's so uh, let's go with these guys. I'll see if what I can. Let's see, I'm gonna. If you can uh, just quickly stop sharing and then I share again. So let me just go into this. I um... don't oh, know. That should be it. I'm always having trouble with this. It's not that difficult, but I hate this kind of double screen sharing thing. So there we go, I think. Okay. Okay, now we come to the real quiz. So everybody should be there. So we have a few. I think maybe people got scared with that kind of um, big bomb coming up. <laughs> I think there were quite a few Arduino and people like who did actually really cool stuff. And um, so, okay, I'll be having everybody. Okay, so these are actually more of the proper questions now. So bacterial microscopy is challenging because. I think this is um, our speaker trying to tell us how right. hard bacterial. it is. Bacteria lack internal spatial organization. They have low spatial resolution compared to total cell size, high photo bleaching uh, in small cells, or low spatial resolution, high photo bleaching range. Ah, look, okay. I think a lot of people saw that there were lots of trouble in. So if in you put, I, I wasn't allowed to put minus points, but if you put bacteria lack internal spatial resol resolution, consider that a minus point. Um, I, I'm, I just, I just. <laughs> Okay, we have question two. Um, right, so can I read this quickly? Yeah. Right, so bacteria is surrounded by a cell wall made of D-glucan, chitin, peptide glycan, or phospholipid. I guess that's very important when you're thinking about the refractive index of um, your imaging, no? Is that kind of... It's thin enough that that's not the major perturbation. Ah, look, everybody kind of most people got very it. good, very good. So we have question number three. Um, okay, so Vercini stands for vertical circle imaging by nanofabricated imprinting, vertical cell immobilization nano imaging. Vertical cell imaging by nanostructure mobilization, or versatile, cool, and immediate nanometric imaging. I think the last one is actually pretty cool. <laughs> it's pretty, yeah. <laughs> but that's like pretty well. Sounds Great. kind of Italian, you know. I thought so. 
<laughs> Gotta have a good acronym. For some reason, we always think Italian sounds kind of cooler. Anyway, whatever it means. <laughs> okay, image denoising can be used to increase time resolution, reduce photo bleaching and phototoxicity, improve uh, signal to noise, or all of the above. Not the hardest of the questions, hopefully. Yeah, we had a few talks on image denoising, but I think it's good to always kind of... Oh, look, not everybody. Ah. Oh, that was more difficult than you thought. Okay, okay. Maybe they thought it was a trick question. Mm. <laughs> okay, one more, the last one now. So make sure you get it quickly as well as right. Okay. Right, so if a model train moved as fast as FTS said, how long would it take to make a full spin around a half metre track around a Christmas tree? Three minutes, three months, three years, or 30 years? I hope people get that one right. <laughs> I mean, it's a toughie. It's It'd be a, shocking if everybody time. got that one. Yes, <laughs> so, you so that, that is trying to figure that out. I didn't realise how little time this had. Trying to figure that out in a few seconds <laughs> is hard. And I must say that my colleague Lisa van der Aert came up with that question, um, which is far better than the other questions. But, that was excellent. Okay, so the last one is just to show who is actually one of our contestants. So there's Liz kind of moving along super fast. And being the winner, you okay, uh, congratulations, can contact Liz. us and... Thank you very much. I think you can put your email and your contact details into the chat, either to me or the Royal Microscopic Society and to Georgina, I think, who's helping us today. So um, thank you very much for participating. And I'm going out now from the screen, but I hope you enjoyed this. I always think it's a nice way to conclude the talk and then starting our, we need to kind of start going through the, um, questions now which people have put on the chat right okay well Seamus thank you very much for your talk very interesting uh, I wasn't able to do the mental arithmetic for the Christmas tree no 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 I mean I would have I would have failed in, in I'm very 10, disappointed right. yeah. um I think I'll get through the questions I'll, I'll go through them so um, um the first one we is actually about um you mentioned super resolution that's um uh, Micah, um, are you still there actually, Micah? If you, if you want to unmute, you can ask the question yourself. Yep. Nope. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, 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 yes, yes, I'm, I'm trying to. Okay, so. Right. <laughs> uh, I would like to show you the video, so. There we very go. Very cozy, very cozy. Hiya. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, so basically, uh, I was just uh, intrigued about this um, uh, using a SIM approach. So, which method did you try? Uh, because you mentioned it was very fast for the bleaching. So yeah, I guess so, it, I guess it was laser based, right? So, so it was. Uh, it's it's classical Gustafsson three D or two D SIM. I mean, tar SIM is not going to work because it needs to be a bit deeper. Um, we also tried iSIM. And which kind of Alison's question just just after as well, I can kind of deal with as well. So so I think um, be, because you've got multiple orders or in the case of something like I send multiple scans, any SIM approach is inherently going to use at least a little bit more light than than just some sort of uniform diffraction emission technique. You can cut it down a lot if you use, you know, nice denoising or, or um, uh, some of the latest algorithms to, so, but but I think inherently you'll always need a bit more light. Certainly the old school 3D SIM that we used or 2D SIM used a lot more light um, because you need high signal to noise to get the deconvolution step to work. Um, iSIM we found to be the worst performing uh, of the lot for this sort of structure. And I, th I think it's because of the micro lenses. I don't know, I've had this conversation. I know the Visitech guys are working on a less, uh, lossy version um so, so that could be interesting and interesting to see what happens there um yeah i hope that answers so, the questions well uh, well not really or no no but I, you mentioned you mentioned um uh, laser, laser free sim um which me which approach do you mean well i mean this uh, you could uh, um, think about this uh, laser free uh, spinning this from orox yeah okay so that that um 
that should be pretty similar to the iSIM approach, right? It's 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 micro lenses, D scan, rescan, just it's with whether you have a spinning disc or a scanning geometry. I I, I think they should be reasonably similar, right? Um, well, the, the light light, thr light throughput, especially on uh, on the collection side, is significantly higher in the in the in the clarity system. Interesting. Okay. Well, yeah. maybe I should because, give that a go. How come? Yeah. Well, because actually it doesn't have pinholes, but it, it's it's using a, a, a grid light structure with 50% transmission, 50% blockage, huh. and also also the reflected light is collected and used to compute the final image. Okay, great. So, right. Well, good you know, it's, it's, it's really it's really photon efficient. Maybe you yeah. have a look at that. Yeah. And, thanks. Uh, okay. So this I is have your some... clarity system. Yes, exactly. Sweet. And uh, I have some people who have been very happy with uh, with imaging bacteria uh, yeah. for a longer time period. So maybe. Okay, great. Thanks for the heads up. All right. So. <clears throat> great. Okay. Thank you very much for that, uh, Micah. Um, so Alison, I think we sort of did the answered your question along the way on that one. So I'll, I will move on to uh, Abantia. If, are you still there? Would you like to ask your question in person or should I just read it out? Okay, well, I think I'll just read that out. I mean, um, Abantia's uh, question was really, why aren't you using deep learning to recognize the annulus? Or are you concerned about artifacts? So what was your reasoning there? Um, I'm not sure which step you mean. If it's I think the that same... was on the deep, deep noise. That, that cropped up about the same time as you went into. Yeah, OK. So, so uh, the, the parallel I was rather, so, so the, the fitting to the annulus, the, the seg some, some, some segmentation we do with machine, ver machine learning, classic machine learning based trained, uh, like state vector machine trained segmentation on elastic. Um, the deep learning comparison I was making was in the context of denoising. And uh, clearly there's been outstanding work. I mean, we've, we've had a really nice collaboration recently with Christoph Spann and, and, and Ricardo Enriquez's lab and Mike Harlem, a bunch of people anyway, looking at just all the different sorts of denoising and, and, and seeing how it works in the context of bacterial microscopy. And so there's great, you know, care, whatever. The reservation I have for denoising specifically um, for structures where, you know, if you're just looking to gain time resolution and you know exactly what's going on with your structure, I'd say you're pretty robust. But if you're looking at perhaps novel structures or novel phenotypes on drug treatment, I get a bit twitchy because I've trained it with the structure that I know and am I biasing it then in my unknown structure. Whereas uh, like classic image processing, like non-local means and other algorithms, they might fail, but they'll fail in a predictable way. And that makes me a lot more confident to use them. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Um, next one down, Alison North was asking about the refractive index of PDMS, but I think, Micah, you've sent a link for that one as well. Um, yeah, I can't remember it off the top of my head. I think it's 1.5-ish, but um, I, I need to check. Sounds like it's somewhere near glycerol, I think, from, from what I saw in that. Okay, is, ah, here we are. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, and, and, um, because we use a silicon objective, the silicon oil objective, and it's fantastic, right. lovely. Okay, so a question from Jonathan Ash is: Is the PDMS master mold available? Well, that's the tricky bit. Um, so these silicon micro pillars, um, at the moment, uh, then they need to be fabricated. Uh, that's currently been done either by like, by like Kevin or a PhD student in Cases Lab. And we have a, some, and we've been sharing with them with collaborators, but the question is how to get into the hands of more people. And uh, the first step on, on that journey is to publish really detailed protocols on how to do it yourself. And then mm -hmm. the second, and that's where we are, and we're hopefully going to um, uh, make that available soon. The second step would be to try to team up with a company to just um, find a someone who can supply it on request for people. And we haven't got that far, but it would be cool. Well, actually, since we're on that subject, I had a question myself. Um, I, I, I may have missed it. Did you did you mention how um, how stiff your um, your agaros was? Obviously, you moved into PDMF, which can be pretty. Oh stiff. yeah. Um, well, I don't know the stiffness in in like stiffness units, but it's six percent agaros, so it's substantially yeah. stiffer than the approximately two percent agaros you normally use. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. That's just and that was important for trapping and for loading and so forth. Okay. Um, yeah, but just just for the Vercini 
uh, um, pillar stuff. Uh, if if anyone's got a really cool question and they want to collaborate, that's the mechanism at the moment, and, and we're happy to do that. If, if we, yeah. Curti has a question about. Um, do you want to do you want to ask that one, Curti, if you're still listening? Yep. Uh, so Seamus, I, I, I see a lot of uh, <clears throat> uh, cool compact box like single molecule setups have come up from Akal, uh, Akhilis Kapanidis group, for example, yes. when I and then uh, Johannes Holbein and yours and a few others maybe which I don't know about. So do you think, uh, so any thoughts like, uh, was there some trend or some, some thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, well, just, uh, so, I mean, obviously a lot of credit is due to Achilles, but um, the other the other thing is um, the the workshop in Oxford Physics had this fantastic machinist training program where these you know these incredibly skilled machinists would then train graduate students and postdocs. I if I was at my desk at work, I'd have this little clock that I made on a mill and a lathe, right? And so so Johannes and I for sure I don't know about um, Bo because I we didn't overlap, but we all made these and got this wonderful introduction to how to physically make engineered objects. Um, and I wish I wish more institutions did that because it's a fantastic resource for like optical biologists. Thanks. Anyway. Okay. Um, actually, Nabantia came back with an answer with another comment actually about um, time lapse sim from Yang et al. in two, 2017. Uh, do you know that paper? Actually, that's not something I I'm I'm aware of actually. Uh... This is this is Jay Zhao Labs um, E. coli science paper, I think. Um, uh, I think if I remember correctly, the figure that they mean this is this is the so so Jay Zhao's had, lab had a wonderful paper to discovering FTZ treadmilling in live cells in E. coli at around the same time as our collaborative group, and they did some three D sim, and we've done three D sim uh, or two D sim of of uh, of FTZ treadmilling around. And and you can do it. You just um, your stacks, your time lapses are a lot shorter. That's all. Um, yeah, and and that's what they saw. I'm pretty sure looking at those images. Okay, I guess we're getting towards the end of the question. So can I just again ask another one? Is is your sort of bread and butter work done with um, GFP tagging? Ah, well, that's a good question. Okay, so um, FTS said is has this rep justifiable reputation as being absolutely fiendishly difficult to tag um, without perturbation. And um, this FTSZ GFP string uh, is one of the few native locus total re replacement fusions available. And yeah. we've tried halo tags, we've tried whatever, and they don't work. Um, for many other applications, um, particularly for a single molecule work, then halo tag plus cell permeable dyes like Janelia fluor dyes have been absolutely game changing. And some other time, I'll tell you all about um, single molecule dynamics of the alongosome and how we can image things for minutes, right? But for FTSZ, we're stuck with GFP because <laughs> okay. none, none of the other ones are viable and that's just life. Yeah, I was just curious about that. And um, okay, I think we don't have any more. Oh, there we got Micah again. Do you try transposé's approach? That's not one uh, I've actually. Not uh, not not us, but yes, um, that's. The, I mean, it's just, we haven't tried that specific approach, but that's that's been tried by other labs. There's been a lot of efforts to tag FTSS in the end, and there's yeah. Um, it depends on the species. And transposés didn't work. Sometimes they decided. This would be the best thing to geek about out about offline, probably. But um, yeah, it's it's diminishing returns at this point, um, to be honest. Um, but but yeah, I get it, yeah. All right. Well, I think in that case, um, since we've sort of got to the end of the questions, let's um, let's wrap up and uh, give a an awkward Zoom a round of applause to you. Thank you very much, Seamus. Thanks so much, everyone, for having me. Okay, I, yeah, nice, nice talking to you all. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Right, bye. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, good. Yeah, right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll see you next week then, but as an audience member. All right, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, you'll probably get an, uh, an email. Oh, no. Right.
I think we're just everyone's signing out now. Um, great. Uh, okay, I'll close down the meeting and hopefully I hear from Aubrey with a talk title and she's not forgotten about us. I'll be in touch. Right, great. Okay, Thank great. Thanks for that. See you soon. Yeah. Bye bye.